Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Diabetes University. Thank you for those of you that have been joining us all throughout this program where we're trying to bring uh, diabetes information to everybody. We have individuals in this program from Gainesville all the way here in Jacksonville. For those of you that are joining us for the very first time, my name is John Redenberg. I am a dietitian and diabetes, education, uh, diabetes educator in the Employee Wellness Office in Jacksonville. So today we'll be taking you through uh, an informative seminar that's really gonna talk about something that can be very, very confusing with persons with diabetes, and that is monitoring of blood sugar. So if you are somebody who is checking your blood sugar on a regular basis, you notice that hmm, sometimes those numbers are a little bit tough to interpret. So today we're going to go over some of the basic information about blood sugar monitoring, look at some of the common monitors used in the marketplace, let you know a little bit about their accuracy, and then talk about some of the newer advances in blood glucose technology. So just so you know, everyone uh, that attends this seminar, we want to uh, make sure that it's as informative as possible. So anytime you have questions or anything that does it make sense? Type it in the chat and I'll uh, do my best to get back with you with an answer. And also for those of you that are brand new, go ahead and hide the video part here, get out of the way. Understand that every session that you attend can help you accumulate points towards your wellness credit. So by attending six sessions, that'll give you 100 points towards your wellness credit. And again, that's for those individuals that are on the Gator Care Insurance Plan. If that doesn't apply to you, then just ignore it. After each class that we do, we will send out a brief post-session quiz. And really this quiz is just basically a way to take attendance since this is a virtual setting. And a lot of times it's difficult to figure out who's actually in attendance. This is the best way in which to do it. So after today's session, you'll get an email that'll include slides of today's talk, a link to the recording, as well as a link for that quiz, which I'll also share at the end too. So again, for this program today, we're gonna to talk about blood glucose monitoring, but we cover a wide range of topics and you know, just attend whichever session most interests you and whether you personally are dealing with diabetes or helping a family member deal with diabetes, we wanna to try to make this as engaging as informative as possible. So without further ado, a quick review of what we're covering today. And many of you already saw that in our introductory email where we talk about what today's session is focused in on, and that is checking our blood sugar. Not always the most fun thing to do when we talk about pricking our finger, but it's still uh, a very necessary part of diabetes of care, especially if you're somebody who is on multiple medications. Now, you also could be an individual who hasn't checked their blood sugar at all. Now, it is not necessary for every single person with diabetes to check their blood sugar. And I'll give you some specific examples of that as we move forward. So everyone's different. So in terms of blood sugar management, the techniques in which to assess blood sugar could be different too. But again, just wanna help you understand a little bit more behind the numbers, what influences those results, and then also share with you some perks that might be beneficial for you uh, if you are on the Gator Care Insurance Plan, we do have some benefits in terms of you know, helping minimize out-of-pocket costs for diabetes self-care. And as I said before, talking about some of the newer technologies with blood glucose monitoring, which includes continuous glucose monitoring. It's been around a while, but uh, we're seeing it become a little bit more increased in prevalence. You may have seen some of the commercials for Dexcom and Freestyle Libre, as well as the Medtronic sensor. So it's become a big part of diabetes care. So for those of you that are new to that particular aspect of the care, I'll give you a brief overview of what it actually is all about and how to get more information if that's something that might be of interest to you by talking with your physician. So if we look at why we want to check our blood sugar, you know, blood sugar is interesting because it's one of those things that can go up or down and we really may not feel it unless it's too extremely um, elevated. Now, just to make sure that everyone could see my screen, just to verify, I've got some slides up here that talk about testing blood sugar. So can everyone see that screen? I just want to get some confirmation there. If you're able to see that, just type it in the chat for me. 
All right. Very good. So Tanya, we'll have to figure out a troubleshooting for you. It looks like everyone else is able to see it. So again, I do apologize, Tanya, if I can't get it to you, but uh, that might be something um, on your end that I might not be able to assist with it at this point in the discussion. So you can at least sit back and listen and I can send to you the slides as well afterwards. So I do apologize for that. So uh, as I was saying, we look at blood sugar levels. They are influenced by a variety of factors. And sometimes we have no idea if it's high or if it's low unless it's too extreme. So because of that, it's still very important to check your blood sugar because sometimes you may not know what it is. And the longer we are not aware of our blood sugar and the longer it might be outside of an optimal range, the greater risk that it can hold in terms of your risk for diabetes complications. So why we test blood sugars, we basically want to know what the score is. You know, it's just like playing a game. You want to know what your score is. It also can let you assess how diet and exercise might affect your blood sugar levels. Uh, maybe it lets you see what kind of treatment changes, how that might have influenced your blood sugar, as well as any other medications you might be taking. So why we test it uh, can have a variety of different answers, but I think the best analogy and again, we'll look at which individuals might need to check a little bit more frequently, but the best analogy in terms of why to check blood sugar is just imagine driving down the street without a windshield, all right? So it's tough to know where you are going if you can't see what's around you. So think of that as a way to assess why checking your blood sugar can be vitally important, especially if you're on multiple medications. And again, I know it may not feel like your blood sugar is too high, but if we don't know if it's running outside of a recommended range, again, your likelihood of complications can increase significantly. So I just, I think uh, having a good check of that blood sugar just lets you know what's going on around you to see if you're on the right track with your diabetes self-care because we wanna take action before it's too late. If we look at some of the complications as it relates to diabetes long-term. And these are things that everyone on this call is probably well aware of. Now, I'm not gonna go over all the minute details with regards to the microvascular and the macrovascular complications, but high blood sugar is the common denominator for the risk of complications. So if we look at your risk of blindness, your risk of kidney failure, your risk of nerve damage is increased significantly if that blood sugar remains elevated. And the reason is, is when we have excess sugar in our blood vessels, it tends to break it down a little bit more quickly. And if you're aware of how the relationship between excess fat can increase our risk for occluded arteries, but excess blood sugar can also break down those blood vessels. And again, accelerate our rate of complications. There's a direct correlation between blood sugar control and risk of complications. So by getting the blood sugar levels under control, we don't have to really worry about some of those nasty complications. And that's the big deal with diabetes, because let's face it, if it wasn't for the complications, diabetes wouldn't be that big of a deal because we wouldn't really care. But since uncontrolled blood glucose does lead to those complications, that's why we have to be very vigilant in our approach to self-care and try to stay within ranges that are recommended by our healthcare professional. So again, along the way, any questions, you can type it in the chat. You can unmute yourself and do it that way if that's easier for you. Might have a delayed response as I try to navigate the chat box. Uh, and the presentation, but you know, we'll, we'll get all of your questions answered. And I just want to make sure we uh, have something for everybody here. So when to check your blood sugar. So as far as the best time to check your blood sugar, that's something that your doctor will share with you. Most of the time patients are checking their blood glucose before a meal. So if you're on a, a minimum recommendation of blood glucose monitoring, they might just have you check it every morning before breakfast. Or if you're on insulin, uh, your healthcare team might want you to check it before every meal and before you go to bed. And some individuals, let's say if you're recent, uh, recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and just started on metformin, 
They might not even ask you to check your blood sugar level at all, and that's fine. However, regardless of the treatment plan that your doctor has provided, it's still important to understand what are the ranges we actually look for. So I'm going to go over some general guidelines. When we check that blood sugar, that's one thing, but knowing what to do with that number, that's the other thing. And when we're looking at blood glucose ranges here in my office, when we look at uh, the diabetes self-management programs that we do here for our employees, I'm generally looking to see, okay, if it's a fasting blood glucose or something before a meal, so after you, uh, you're waking up in the morning or if it's been several hours since your last meal, we're looking at a range somewhere between 80 and 130, all right? If it's been two hours after a meal, we're looking at something under the ballpark of about 180. So again, it does fluctuate based on where you are at a given point in time. Now, your healthcare team may recommend specific ranges based on what your personal history is, but more often than not, the ranges that we're going for are going to be somewhere in that target. As it starts to consistently get above that 140 threshold, that's where we start to see some gradual deterioration in those blood vessels. That's where the damage starts to occur when we look at the excess sugar in the blood as it impacts our blood vessels. So that's what we're trying to protect against. And the other thing, and this is just more of a personal preference, but also really uh, to remove the judgments that tend to circulate around blood sugar. There aren't any good or bad blood glucose levels. You know, if you're, you're checking your blood glucose uh, in the morning and it's 192, it's not bad. I mean, yes, it's outside of the range, but I don't want you to attach any judgment to that blood glucose level. Part of successful diabetes self-management is just problem solving some of those readings and trying to look back and see, okay, well, I had maybe a slightly larger meal the day before, or I forgot to take a dose of medication, or I've been under the weather, looking at where those potential areas in your life that may have impacted your blood sugar, and then taking action, not cast in judgment that, oh, this is a bad blood glucose. So I try to get most of my patients to not look at blood sugar levels in that black and white, good and bad dichotomy, because I think long-term, it's just not going to be helpful. Now, I'm going to share one more slide. And again, as a review, we're going to send out this entire presentation, whether you like it or not, uh, for, for your review. But this is just a broader picture of what some of the blood glucose goals are for adults. Now, again, it's slightly different for the pediatric population, but if we look at organizations such as the American Diabetes Association, okay, right here in the middle column, as well as the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, that is the column right over here, you see some slight differences. And again, there's, there's reasons why there's some variations among healthcare professionals, but you see by and large, we're looking for ranges before meal right around the low 100s, okay? for normal values. Again, so for individuals who don't have a diagnosis of diabetes, we want to see ranges somewhere around here. So if you're somebody without diabetes, even after a meal, we really don't like to see that blood glucose level go above 140. Without diabetes, the body does a pretty good job at maintaining a homeostasis in terms of blood glucose ranges. Now, here's a newsflash. As I said before, we're all different. So your specific goals are going to vary by what your healthcare team feels might be best and what you might feel is best. We do see some slightly higher goals for people who have had problems and issues with uh, frequent hypoglycemia, or maybe they're not fully aware of the symptoms of low blood sugar. So we want to protect them by giving them a little bit more of a wider range for blood glucose goals. Older adults, we might see better suited for a slightly higher target for blood sugar, or if there's other underlying conditions. So individuals with heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, we could see you know, some, some slightly higher targets for blood glucose. Because again, we want to achieve blood glucose levels that'll help keep us healthy and also enhance our quality of life. So those overall ranges could vary a little bit from person to person. So it's always good to check with your healthcare team to say, hey, 
where should I be in terms of my specific targets? So we're gonna talk a little bit, I think just procedurally, because again, when I'm doing counseling in my office and you know, when we get back into the in-person uh, consultations, I do see some errors made in how blood sugar is tested and these errors can have a significant impact on the number. So if you're gonna check your blood sugar, we might as well do it properly so we're getting the best result, just like you want your gas gauge to give you the most accurate reading on your fuel in your car. You want your blood sugar test to be done to minimize errors. And the biggest mistake I see people make time and time again is they aren't drying their hands, all right? So we know we wanna have clean, dry hands to check blood sugar because if you're handling those test strips with water on your hands, you're going to more than likely damage the other test strips that are in whatever container it's stored in. Keeping those test strips dry is very important. Keeping them in their sealed original container can help minimize some of the humidity that occurs, especially here in Florida, and keep the, the mechanism, the enzymes that are used to detect sugar in the blood intact. So always make sure you wash and dry your hands well. If you're using warm soap and water, you don't need alcohol swabs. You can use those in place of washing or drying hands, but it's not needed. The same rules apply if you're using alcohol, you want it to fully dry too. Because remember, we're trying to check our blood sugar, not the alcohol on our finger, all right? So most of the time, we're just gonna advise patients to follow the instructions that came with your meter, which means putting that test strip in the meter, pricking the side of your finger with a lancet, make sure you're just using that lancet one time. They're single use only. The more often you use it, two things are going to occur. That lancet's gonna get duller, so it's gonna hurt more, and your chance for infection is going to increase too. So make sure you, you uh, use it and lose it. Throw it into that sharps container after you after you use it. And then you just touch your finger to the side of the test strip and boom, after a few seconds, you've got your results. For those of you that have been in diabetes care for a long time, we notice some significant advancements in how we check blood sugar outside of just the continuous glucose monitoring, which we'll talk about. The timing of blood glucose is so much faster now than it was 20, 30 years ago. You know, just a little personal anecdote. I was diagnosed uh, with diabetes in 1988, and I had to use a Lancet device that looked like a mini handheld guillotine, and it took 120 seconds before I got my reading. So it may not sound like a lot, but two minutes, you know, I had to prick my finger, put, put a drop of blood on the test strip, wait 60 seconds, wipe the test strip, put it in the machine, wait another 60 seconds, and then I had my results. So for those of you that have been in nursing for a long period of time, you probably remember that exact same meter I'm talking about. So we've come a long way. So we can get the results pretty quickly now, which again, does a very, very important thing for persons with diabetes. It helps improve and maintain quality of life. So I do have a little bonus trivia for you. Why should you only use the sides of your finger? Why should you only use the sides of your finger when checking blood sugar? If you have the answer, you can type it in the chat. It's not mandatory. I'll give you a little, give you a few more seconds to think about why we're using the sides versus the fingertips. If anyone's going to go out on a limb and type in an answer, but I'm about to give it away. So if we look at checking our blood sugar, using the sides of your finger, it's very, very important. You use the sides of your finger and not the fingertips because you have more nerve endings on your fingertips. So yes, Jane, very good. It does hurt more, but more important than it hurting more is that if you consistently use the tips of your finger, you're going to damage those nerve endings on your fingertips, which could put you at risk for other problems. You could, you could touch something that's hot or, or sharp and maybe not realize it, okay? So that's the most important thing. You wanna help protect the uh, nerve endings in your fingertips so you can more, uh, so you can maintain a greater sense of touch. So you, by using the sides of your finger, you can still pre uh, preserve that 
that sense of touch in your fingertips. So very good. Thank you for playing along and humor me. I do have one more of those that I'm going to throw in here later on, but again, I won't bombard you with, with too many trivia questions here. So another question that comes up a lot of times in the office is that, all right, I bought this blood glucose meter or I've been checking my blood sugar on a regular basis. Can I trust it? How accurate are these blood glucose meters? So in order for a meter to be sold, so if you go to CVS or Walgreens, Walmart, wherever you might shop, if you look at all the meters on the shelf, they have to be cleared by the FDA before they can be sold. And in order for them to be cleared, research or the testing for accuracy has to show that 95% of all the values that that particular meter has measured has come within 15% of a lab measurement, okay? so. If you check your blood sugar and it's 125, that means that 95% of those readings, so if I did it over the course of a month, must be within 15 percentage points of that 125. So if I'm checking it and it's 125 on a meter, but the lab is telling me it's 200, well, that's a problem. So the more often those problems occur, that's gonna impact the ability of the meter to be sold. So 95% of the time, it has to come close to that marker. 99% of the time, it must be within 20% of that true value. But here's the catch. That data in terms of the accuracy is actually company reported. So if, I, if, if all of us were gonna pull our money together and just build our own blood sugar meter, we would have to do testing within our company for accuracy and submit that to the FDA. So there is some bias there, perhaps. There is a, there is a potential for conflict of interest. So that is one of the limitations when we look at the accuracy about some of these meters, because they aren't all created equal. Now, some of the differences when we look at problems with uh, blood glucose monitoring are triggered by the user if they're not drying their hands properly, if they're not uh, storing the test strips properly, or, or if they're using expired test strips or if the meter is damaged, those can impact the value too. But in terms of straight function, we saw some interesting results in a 2018 study. So you can see the full report on that link at the bottom of your screen. And again, you'll be able to kind of uh, look a little bit deeper into this article if you so choose. But in 2018, there was a, an accuracy study done by a group called the Diabetes Technology Society. So what this society did was look at, okay, just how accurate are some of the more popular blood sugar meters that are on the market? So they looked at, they looked at 18 different meters. So they went to uh, three different cities and they looked at results for you know, over a thousand different people and basically bought all these meters off the shelf. And here's what those results showed. So there were six devices that really met the criteria that the FDA had established. Contour, AccuCheck Avivo, the Walmart Confirm, the CVS Advance, the Freestyle Light, the AccuCheck. So you can see the ones that pass, but 12 of the 18 that they look at didn't meet the minimum standards that the FDA had set. Now, some of them were close. You know, we see some 92%, some 90%, some 89%. But when you get further down here, 71 and 76 and 76%, that tells you that only three out of the four times did that meter result match about 15% of a true lab measurement. So this is very important. So we want to make sure you understand what we're looking at when we look at blood glucose level ranges. I do think the Contour, the AccuCheck, and the Walmart, as well as the Freestyle, consistently deliver high quality results that we can feel confident in. But some of the others that are out there, especially some of the ones that are coming from, you know, these uh, remote providers like Embrace and True Result, those seem to be a little bit more prone to inaccuracy. Now, for those of you that are in the healthcare side, for those of you that are on the nursing floors and, and doing inpatient uh, and outpatient glucose monitoring, there are different standards for hospital meters. So this, again, these standards in terms of the 95% and the 99% accuracy, that only applies to home blood glucose monitors. So again, something to think about when we look at what and how accurate these meters are. 
And I was glad to see after this study, when we looked at what type of meters to use for our persons with diabetes, uh, and that's contour. So it'd be very awkward if I was about to tell you that the one meter that we cover is actually one of the ones that fails on the screen ahead of, uh, before this, but it's not. Uh, Gator care patients are going to be covered at 100% in terms of no out-of-pocket costs for the Contour Next as well as the Contour Next EZ. All right, so if you are somebody that's checking your blood sugar on a regular basis and is a Gator Care patient, I would highly encourage you to go to the Gator Care website that you see on your screen for details about the program. How it works is basically you just take a simple learning module that talks about how to monitor your blood sugar. It takes about 30 minutes. That information is collected by Gator Care and stored in the database. And then after about two or three weeks, that information is, is shared with all the pharmacies around the region. You just ask your physician for a, a prescription for those test strips and it's covered at 100%. Doesn't cover the lancets, uh, but you can get those at a fairly low cost at Amazon. I think I bought a box of 100 uh, on Amazon for you know less than 10 bucks. So you can pre, uh, find them pretty economically. Uh, and you can get the actual meter, the tangible meter itself by calling the 800 number on your screen uh, and mentioning that ID code. Most of your providers in terms of blood glucose meters are going to give you the meter for free because they want you to you know, purchase those test strips. So even if you aren't a Gator Care member, I do think the Contour meter offers a uh, another advantage besides its accuracy is that it's one of the ones that seems to have uh, among the more economical uh, prices for the test strips themselves, that and the Walmart brand. So if you look at that Walmart brand that was on that previous screen, the two of those you can get stripped for a pretty good cost if you're having to pay for it out of pocket. But again, some things to think about, especially if you're on the, uh, the UF Health Insurance Plan. Now, another important test that we look at with diabetes care is something called the A1C. So you may have heard that term tossed around your doctor's office. I get my A1C check. I get the A1C or my A1C is up, my A1C is down. But if it's unfamiliar to you, I want to kind of give you a little bit more insight as to, to how this test can be used to assess blood sugar control and why there are still some limitations to it. So we'll often see this prescribed or order for people to look at average blood sugar over a two to three month period. What the A1C test is actually measuring is basically just how much sugar is sticking to red blood cells. Okay, so the more sugar that's sticking to a red blood cell, that means the higher the average blood sugar level is likely been. As our blood sugar elevates, so does the amount of glucose in our bloodstream, obviously, which is going to stick to the red blood cells. So we'll use it for not just assessing control of blood sugar over a period of time, but also for diagnosing diabetes. If we look at in terms of how accurate it can be, there's still a margin of error there when we look at blood glucose levels, and I'll share with that in a moment. But there is one important thing to understand here when we look at A1C tests, especially if you're somebody who is taking advantage of some of the home testing that is out there. Uh, in terms of the home test, it's not necessary to do it for more than once every two or three, excuse me, it's not more than, uh, necessary to do it more than once every two or three months. If you're doing it any more frequent than that, you're not really getting a true result because the actual result of that A1C just reflects a three month period, okay? Uh, I can't go any smaller than that. So it's only three months. So if you are somebody who has diabetes, if you're having this ordered more than four times a year, talk to your healthcare provider because that's a little bit more than what's advised. At most, uh, it's going to be four times a year, but on average, it could be about twice a year, depending on where you are in terms of your uh, level of control. There was a question there that came on. So, uh, so yes, if you viewed the video for the Gator Care offer previously, do you need to do it again? So if that is the video you're talking about that was over a year ago, 
yes, this is a slightly different module. That program actually was for a different type of meter too. So I would say go ahead and, and click on the link and uh, view it again just to be safe. But yeah, there was a different learning module that was used last year that's a little bit different for this coming year. But if you're talking about within the past five months and you've already viewed it, no, you don't have to do it again. But if it preceded, um, I think they put it out there last November. So if it preceded last November, I would go ahead and watch it again. And, and you can email me offline if there's some more questions or issues, I'd be, I'd be happy to help you. All right, so one more little bonus question, closer look. So I said the A1C test is only good for three months. Who out there knows why it's only three months? These are some facts that you can amaze your friends with at parties. So if we look at hemoglobin A1C, only able to look at blood glucose levels over a three month period and not any higher than that and not any less frequent than that, because the average life of a red blood cell is three months. So very good, Jane, excellent work. So the average lifespan of a red blood cell is about 90 days. So as it you know, uh, works its way through its lifespan, it's going to be uh, regenerated. And again, we, we can't check it any more frequent than that because of the uh, lifespan of the red blood cell. Now, if we look at the estimated average glucose, so if we look at your A1C result, and uh, for many individuals, your A1C target, it's gonna be probably around this seven percentile range. Again, your doctor might give you a little bit more specific number. If you're prone to uh, frequent low blood sugars, they might say that you're a little bit better off in the 7.5 range, maybe even eight. Uh, but what you can see is a correlation between average blood sugar and A1C results, but most of the patients that I've worked with were looking at results somewhere in the seven to 6.5 in terms of a goal. When we're checking our A1C levels. That's what the goal is that we're looking for. Now we can't get to the goal overnight. If you're at a 12, we can't expect you to be at a seven in three months, although it does happen at times if we're making some medication adjustments. But again, the goal is seven or the goal is 6.5, but it may take some time to get there depending on where you are in your plan of care. Now, combination of routine finger sticks along with an A1C level gives you and your healthcare team a pretty broad insight as to what's going on with your overall blood sugar control. But there are some limitations. There are some limitations with the A1C level that can be minimized by doing something called continuous glucose monitor. But before we talk about that, here's how the A1C level works. Remember, it's an average blood sugar. So it's not going to account for big spikes in your blood glucose. If you look at the picture on your screen, you can see the variability in blood glucose for three different people, all with the same 7% A1C, all with the same average blood sugar of 154. So the A1C really isn't going to tell us how consistent that person's blood glucose levels are within range. It's a good, it's a good marker, but it does have some limitations. So that's why the conjunction of the A1C with some finger sticks does give the healthcare team a little bit more insight. We also see some variability in reading just based on genetic differences in red blood cell formation, uh, as well as how how glucose or how um, sugar adheres to the red blood cell. There is some, some racial differences there. So again, that accounts for some of the variability. There was a study done that looked at some of the differences uh, uh, detail right there at the bottom of that slide if you want to look at it for further insight. And on average, most labs were looking at a 0.4% margin of error for the A1C. So that means if you had an A1C measured at seven, could have actually been 7.4 or 6.6. .6. So again, that's the approximate margin of error. So again, it is a good tool. It's a good yard marker in terms of three month control, but it isn't going to give the complete picture. So I wanna wrap up by talking about the next level of blood glucose monitoring. And this isn't for everybody, you know, but for those individuals that are looking to get a little bit more consistent insight 
into their minute by minute blood glucose levels, continuous glucose monitoring is going to be that solution. So what it is, is a wearable device, all right? You can see there's an example of what the Dexcom looks like. So it's a very small, thin wire that's introduced into the skin through a needle and it's measuring blood sugar in the interstitial fluid. Okay, so it's not actually measuring blood glucose per se, but the amount of glucose that's actually in the interstitial fluid. So it tends to follow what blood sugar, capillary blood sugar is actually doing because it's the secondary location. So you can see if it's high in your blood vessels first, it's going to be high in the interstitial fluid a little bit later. And if you can imagine it as like a roller coaster where blood glucose and sensor glucose have a, a ebb and flow relationship. So as it elevates in our blood glucose, the sensor glucose will be a little bit further behind and the same as it drops. So more often than not, these two levels are closely correlated except after meals and during exercise. So there's gonna be some variability there, but there's enough accuracy with this type of glucose reading where we can make treatment decisions. So for those of you that do wear a continuous glucose monitor and are on an insulin pump, you can make adjustments to your insulin pump based on what the readings of that CGM are telling you. Most of the time, the data that that transmitter is sending can also can be sent to a third party device. So they'll come with their own transmitter, but you can also have it communicate directly uh, with an iPhone or another secondary device. So it does give some advantages to the user because you don't have to lug around uh, a blood glucose meter or a separate device and you can have it all fairly integrated. And again, can improve quality of life, but again, it's not for everybody. So we do know that benefits of CGM is that it's looking at trends in blood sugar rather than isolated points. So your blood sugar could be 200, but in half an hour, it could be 150. So there can be some great variation in blood glucose. So the CGM is, is good for looking at those trends and, and can eliminate, if not minimize, the need for finger sticks. So for those people that use a Dexcom, or for those in, uh, individuals that use the Freestyle Libre, I think those are two that do not require a finger stick calibration. I do believe the Medtronic version, which is the one you see right here, does require an initial calibration. But again, these, these things uh, you know, change month after month, so it's tough to keep up. But overall, no matter what type of device you are using, it's going to basically eliminate the need for those finger sticks because it's going to just give you a continuous reading so you can kind of see how things are going. Now, those are the advantages. The disadvantages is that the out-of-pocket costs can be higher for this type of device, and it's best suited for those individuals who are on insulin. So if you are somebody that's just taking metformin or one or two diabetes medications, that may not be the best tool for you. You might be still be best served with just more frequent finger sticks. But again, uh, it is a tool that could be something to, to consider moving forward if your needs change in terms of the type of medication that you are going to use. Now, again, since I know our audience does involve a lot of individuals who are on our current plan, Dexcom is our preferred uh, provider. I'll get to your question there in a, a minute, Teresa there. Hold on, sorry, one second, I lost, uh, lost my screen. Dexcom is the covered brand under Gator Care and then Freestyle Libre and Medtronic Guardian are not covered, but I do believe the Guardian can be covered if it's correlated with the insulin pump. So there's an, an all-in-one loop package that is provided by Medtronic and that coverage may be a little bit different. All right, so. Question is, glucose sensors are usually correlated except for four meals or after meals. Yes, uh, I did say that. So there's a, there's a good relationship between the sensor glucose and blood glucose where the blood glucose is kind of the front of a railroad car, the front of a roller coaster. So as our blood glucose goes up, that front car is our blood sugar. So if we look at that previous, previous slide there, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. The, as the blood sugar elevates, it could be 150 if we did a finger stick of the blood sugar, but our sensor could say 125. And as we eat, our blood sugar level will go up. So it will be reflected first in a finger stick and reflected second through the sensor glucose. And as it's dropping, okay? So again, the, the inverse would hold true. It would be lower with the finger stick and slightly higher 
with the sensor glucose. So for those of you that are wearing a sensor, when it's low, that means it's really low. So we wanna make sure we take immediate action. A lot of times the technology has advanced to a point where we're using a lot of predictive algorithms to make sure that we aren't having someone get into a position where their blood glucose levels is dropping to such a, a dangerous level. So good question. All right, so just to wrap up, when we look at problem solving for blood sugar changes, when I was first starting out in diabetes education, we were told, all right, there's three things that affect a person's blood sugar, food, exercise, and diabetes medication. Oh yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. But as we learn more and more about blood glucose and about other factors that it's, it's not that easy. There's a lot of other things that affect blood sugar. And those are, these are some things that you're probably already well aware of. Our stress, the time of day, you know, first early in the morning as the, as the liver starts to kick out more sugar, your blood sugar might be up. Illness can affect it. Side effects from other medications like steroids can impact blood sugar. Hydration status, menstruation status, sleep status. All of these things go into impacting our blood glucose. So the important thing to remember is looking at that point in time, taking a step back and asking yourself, okay, what could I have done differently to help me adjust this number? If we're dealing with frequent low blood sugars, frequent high blood sugars, that's what you have to ask yourself first. It's important not to, to beat yourself up over some of these results because it is influenced by a variety of factors. Now, food and medicine are still the big ones, all right? So more often than not, I'll try to look at those two first as I'm talking to patients, but there are other factors that can influence it too, but it's up to you to figure out, okay, well, what can I do about this? And if you have questions in terms of understanding, well, what could I do about this? That's what we're here for. So as a resource for all of our employees, providing diabetes counseling is what we do. So if you do get to a point, you're like, you know, John, my blood sugar is 200 all the time. I have no idea why. Give me a call. We'll talk about it or talk to your healthcare team to see how it can be troubleshoot. I think the, the tendency sometimes in diabetes care is to overlook some of these high results because they really don't want to cause acute pain. It doesn't really hurt to have a blood sugar of 200 or 250, but over a period of months or years, it can. So it's important to try to minimize that as much as possible and always look at, okay, what type of problem solving can I do to help achieve better outcomes with my blood sugar? And if you do have questions, that's what we're here for. So I know it went right up against our time here today, but I do appreciate everybody that tuned in. I will email a copy of these slides as well as the presentation to everyone. If you have your smartphone handy, you could take it out and scan that barcode. What that barcode is gonna do is just take you right to that post-test. Again, this is primarily for attendance credit. So we wanna just be able to track how many people are watching this particular seminar uh, and be able to award wellness points for them as applicable. Uh, next month, we will be talking about physical activity. So physical activity is probably one of the most underutilized ways to control blood sugar. I always call it mother nature's metformin because if we look at how metformin works and how exercise works, they do the same exact thing in the body. So we'll talk about how to get started, why it helps, and also go over some recommendations for the types of physical activity. So if there's any questions, I'll back up here on the screen here. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. I'm gonna pause the recording.